folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Black Power. Support Jay. this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black. I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Today is Monday, March 11, 2024, and coming up on Roller Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Donald Trump wants to slash Social Security. President Joe Biden hits him hard on that. That would have a tremendous impact on black folks. Uh, the Biden campaign uh, is uh, talks partners with uh, three uh, PACs. First of all, those three PACs 
announce a $30 million blitz targeting minority voters. The question is, what is being spent with Black-owned media? Also, we'll talk with uh, the leader of Higher Heights about what they are doing uh, to get more Black women elected to public office. Also, Quentin Brown with Collective Pack, one of the co-founders, will be also joining us talking about that ad spin and the issue as well. Plus, Joe Rogan and Christopher Rufo attack White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre, saying she's horrible at her job and she was only hired because of her identity. Have y'all ever heard anybody white say that somebody white got hired because they are a white woman or a white man? Mm, I don't think so. Housing Secretary Marsha Fudge becomes the second Biden cabinet member to resign. We'll talk about that. Also, uh, a, uh, so, so we'll talk about also, again, uh, the Higher Heights poll. Plus, y'all, Fit Live Win segment, uh, we're talking about Alzheimer's and its impact on African Americans. Plus, it's been 10 years since Mike Brown was killed in St. Louis. His mother will join us uh, to talk about uh, their scholarship effort. It's time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. So you remember last year's State of the Union when President Joe Biden slammed Republicans about cutting Social Security, and they all said, oh, that's a lie, even though they were all on tape saying the exact same thing. And then this year, he slammed them again, and they booed again, and he was like, um, so y'all not trying to cut Social Security? Well, here's Donald Trump on CNBC tonight. One thing that I, I think that at least the perception is that there's not a whole lot of, of difference between what you think we should do with uh, entitlements or non-discretionary spending and what President Biden uh, is proposing. It's almost the third rail of politics. And we've got, a, a what, a $33, $34 trillion uh, total debt built up and, and very little we can do in terms of, of cutting spending. Discretionary is not going to help. Have you changed your your outlook on how to handle entitlement, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, Mr. President, it seems like it, it, something has to be done or else we're going to be at a, stuck at 120 percent of, of debt to GDP forever. So first of all, there is a lot you can do in terms of entitlements, in terms of cutting and in terms of also uh, the theft and the, the bad management of entitlements, tremendous bad management of entitlements. There's tremendous amounts of things and numbers of things you can do. So I don't, you know, necessarily agree with the statement. Hmm. Well, guess what? The Biden folks did not waste time responding to Trump's call to cut entitlements such as Social Security and Medicaid. Many of my Republican friends want to put Social Security and Medicare back on the chalking block, block again. If anyone tries to cut Social Security and Medicare or raise retirement age again, I will stop them. Working. working people built this country. They pay more into Social Security than millionaires and billionaires do. It's not fair. Folks, we have two ways to go at Social Security and Medicare. Republicans will cut Social Security and Medicare to give us more tax cuts for the wealthy. Even this morning, Donald Trump said cuts to Social Security and Medicare are on the table again. When asked if he changed his position, he said, quote, there's a lot you can do in terms of cutting. Tremendous amount of things you can cut. It may be precise. Tremendous amount of things you can do, not cut. He said, I will, and, but the bottom line is, he's still at it. I'm never going to allow that to happen. I won't cut Social Security. I won't cut Medicare. 
Instead of cutting Medicare and Medicare and give tax breaks to the wealthy, I will protect and strengthen Social Security and Medicare and make the wealthy begin to pay their fair share. Dr. Julian Malvo, economist and author out of D.C., uh, joins us at the Amakongo Dabinga Senior Professorial Lecturer, School of International Service, American University of D.C., Teresa Lundy. Uh, of course, principal founder of TML Communications out of Philadelphia. Glad to have three of you here. So, look, Julian, Republicans have long wanted to cut uh, entitlements, but here's the whole deal. Uh, black folks just don't depend upon those. It's a whole bunch of white folks, uh, and so they can keep talking about that, that is not going to go over well with the white folks in those red states, and it damn sure is not going to go over well with black folks. You know, Roland, more than 50 percent of retirees have Social Security as their only source of retirement income. <clears throat> the only source of their retirement income. And so when you start talking about cutting, they've done two things. Number one, they've raised the retirement age. So it used to be 65. Now um, it's 66 and change, like 66 and in months, and it's going to keep going up. That's number one. Now that's okay for folks like you and me and the panel. You know, we earn our livings by thinking. But if you're a sister who's been a waitress or a brother who's been a construction worker, this does not work out well for you. So number one, raising the age is a deleterious in an equitable issue. Now, number two, when you talk about who pays, you pay a percentage, about 12 percent total, which is divided by your employer and you, uh, of your salary up to $168,000. So anyone who makes more than $168,000 has not paid any more into Social Security after, like, the first week of January. Now, why do they get a break? Because predatory capitalists, you know, I got to use my word, predatory capitalists are protecting them. If everybody paid the 12%, which turns out to 6% for you, if everybody paid that up to how much ever money they made, guess what? Social Security would not be in trouble. Uh, the orange man who wants to be president obviously has never paid into Social Security tax or anything else for that matter. We're not going there. But the other thing about that is he's protecting his friends. Elon Musk paid his first social, first and last Social Security payment on January 2nd. And we could go down the list. So Trump is trick-bagging folks, but that's what he's doing. People who are over, who are, who are, under 70, you need to pay attention to this. This problem could be fixed yesterday if everybody paid equally into the fund. Right. Uh, now, uh, 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 one second. Oma Congo, Rep House Republican Conference, they want to raise the age to 69. They want to cut future benefits by 13 uh, percent. They want to cut some $700 billion over 10 years. And again, what you're looking at uh, are folks uh, who I, I, I never hear them ever, ever say, you know what? I think we spend enough on defense. Mm -hmm. I, I think yeah. we spend enough. It's amazing how defense never gets cut. It keeps going up, 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 but they want to cut Social Security, and that's a non-starter for a lot of people in this country. Absolutely. And, you know, defense spending keeps going up as they keep trashing the military, right? So the hypocrisy is glaring. And I really believe that, you know, what Biden is doing is very strong. It's very important in terms of taking the messages to the people. But the people also have to take the message to these Republicans. I'm thinking about what, what happened over in France and, and the protests that were happening when they tried to, to raise the retirement age there. And I think that, you know, Dr. Marvo breaks it down so clearly about what just a year raise in the age, year and a half raise, what it can do to people who fully depend on that. And so I think that Biden coming off the State of the Union, he got them again on Social Security, you know, the second time around. Keep taking that to the people. Surrogates, keep taking that to the people. Because like you said, this is not just a red state issue or, or a blue state issue. This affects everybody. And the more that they can bring these small messages home, you know, we always talk about, okay, what, you know, foreign policy and all of these other major things. But when people talk about these kitchen table issues, you talk 
talking about people's benefits for a system that's already paid into. They always make it Social Security look like it's this doom and gloom thing and that everybody's throwing everything into this failing system. This is money that's already taken care of. And really, at the end of the day, if we can raise people's knowledge about this and not just with, you know, the senior citizens and the like who are closer to needing it, with younger people as well as Dr. Mabel said, dealing with people under 70 and 65, this can be as big a campaign issue, maybe not as big, of course, as issues relating to, uh, you know, things like uh, abortion and women's reproductive rights. That's kind of like number one right now. But this can be a top three issue that people can really bring home to people uh, during this campaign season, and I really hope that they nail that, because Trump's key is going to keep stepping in it and giving us more fodder if people keep asking him about it as well. Well, in fact, uh, Teresa, uh, his campaign, real quick, now they're backtracking uh, on that. They know it's called the third rail for a reason. That's right. Yeah, it is. Um, it's actually interesting because on the campaign trail, Trump literally had, this is in 2020, uh, a few videos about Medicare and Social Security um, that literally said, um, under no circumstances should Republicans vote to cut a single penny from Medicare or Social Security. Uh, and now it looks like he's back in uh, the opposite of that talking point. I think what it is, is there's so many backroom conversations um, even that interview he did on CNBC, it, it was, you know, mostly I feel like the, the conversations got a bit confused on what he stands on. Um, but as we look at, you know, the next generation and new generation, um, you know, this is something that we do have to be concerned about. Those who are working, you know, 50 to, to $80,000 a year and we're putting into a pension plan that is also thinking about um, that's a little bit wary for us. So I think that's where, you know, we'll start to see a whole bunch of different nuances. But I think it's also a, a great opportunity for Biden's campaign to really, you know, when we, again, talk about kind of reiterating some of my um, my panelists here, talk about some of those kitchen tables issues. This is one of them that I do believe hits every household. Uh, it does. And in, uh, in the Washington Post, uh, they had uh, this um, story here, uh, how it was described as a very important or somewhat important issue. Go to my iPad. Uh, you see right here, uh, overall, um, nearly um, <clears throat> nearly 70 percent uh, among Democrats, a little bit higher. Independence is lower, but it's almost the same number with Republicans. You see under 30 and 34, not as important, but 45 to 65, extremely important. 65 and up, that number goes past 75 percent. Guess who does well among voters 65 plus? Biden blows Trump away. Guess who votes at a higher rate than any other age group? 65 plus. So, yeah, uh, this is one that does uh, real well uh, for Biden and Democrats. That's why the Trump campaign was saying, oh, no, 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 he was talking about waste, not Social Security and Medicare. Right, right. All right, y'all, we come back. Uh, three uh, PACs talk, focused, on, focused on minorities uh, pledged to spend some $30 million to get the vote out. Uh, is the Biden campaign, are they taking this seriously? What are they doing to drive what's happening on the ground to reach black voters? We'll talk to uh, one of the co-founders of Collective Pack up next. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. An angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. your 
business or career with Grow with Google's wide range of online courses, digital training, and tools. Gain in-demand job skills with flexible online training programs designed to put you on the fast track to jobs in high growth fields. No experience is necessary. Learn at your own pace. Complete the online certificate program on your own terms. Stand out to employers, get on a path to in-demand jobs, and connect with top employers who are currently hiring. Take one professional career certificate program or all six. Earn a Google Career Certificate to prepare for a job in a high growth field like data analytics, project management, UX design, cybersecurity, and more. All professional career certificate programs must be completed by December 31st, 2024. Scan the QR code to complete the application. There are 1,000 scholarships available. Grow with Google and J. Hood and Associates. Be job ready and qualify for in-demand jobs. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, you're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037- 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. life with me, Dr. Jackie, just who do you think you are? And maybe more importantly, who is it that you think you're trying to please? The answer to that second question is really wrapped up in the first. Think about that. Being the true, authentic you, no matter the circumstance. But we learn the art of forgiveness, not only of forgiving one another, but forgiving ourselves. And we also learn how to love ourselves so that we can love each other. That's next on A Balanced Life here on Black Star Network. What's up, Geek Tony in the place to be. Got Cake Touch at Mama's University, creator and executive producer of Fat Tuesdays, the air hip hop comedy. But right now, I'm rolling with Roland Martin, unfiltered, uncut, unplugged, and undamn believable. You hear me? been frozen out. Facing an extinction level event. We don't fight this fight right now. You're not going to have black on you. All right, folks, the Biden campaign has announced a $30 million uh, campaign blitz targeting battleground state, states, specifically also targeting uh, black and Latina uh, outlets. They're really going to be looking at, uh, of course, a lot of March Madness is coming up, and so targeted folks are going to be watching uh, NCAA games. In addition to that, uh, they also are ramping up their efforts on the ground, opening some 100 offices uh, across these various battleground states. Uh, this, of course, uh, is something that, I frankly say they should have been doing really six months ago, primarily because the campaign was starting a lot sooner. Donald Trump had long announced that he was running, and I was saying in early last year, they have to start much earlier than they normally do. I'm going to go to Julian first. Julian, this is the thing that, again, when you, when you break down uh, these, when you break down the campaign, they are running, they're trying to run this campaign like a normal traditional campaign. That to me makes no sense. If you look at the numbers, the numbers are very clear. And that is, 
black, the black numbers are way down. Same thing with Latinos. I have been arguing they needed a much earlier runway, and that is starting much earlier, trying to teach, educate, and enlighten voters on what, they do, what they've done. They've now put themselves in a difficult position because now you're ramping up. Uh, this is March. You're not going into April. You shorten now your window. At the latest, they should have been going hard in January. Uh, your thoughts? Well, first of all, you're absolutely right about the way that this should have happened. We knew this was going to blow down to a two-person. Uh, Dem should have been on top of it. But <clears throat> secondly, and more importantly, Roland, $30 million spend post the State of the Union, which was Brother Biden did a good job. We're going to give him credit for that. But now $30 million is going to who? I mean, we know where the weaknesses are. They're in our community where we're looking at as many as 20 percent and some say 30 percent of African-American people, especially men, leaning toward the orange man. So we're looking at that. We're looking at uh, diminished enthusiasm of, among African-Americans, especially younger people. Who are the people who have these contracts? Who are the people out of the, what slice do we get out of this $30 million? We know that we are represent roughly 30 percent, roughly 30 percent, could be more, of the Democratic base. If that's the case, they're spending 30 million. Are we getting 30 percent of that 30 million? That would be 9 million. How much of it do you have? How much of it does BET have? How much does the other black media have? They have a, a whole array of podcasters and others who are getting little subsidies. How many of them are of African descent? How many of them speak to their base? You know, Roland, I, there's a company. Uh, I was doing some research because I want to know who they're spending the money on. And there's a company called Putnam. Um, they've done six presidential campaigns. They're white-owned, and they're highly regarded. They don't even have black subs, black subcontractors. So what kind of spit is that? If Democrats want our vote they're going to have to treat us like they treat everybody else. When they announce a $30 million spend, here's what needed to happen. They needed to say, and X number of dollars are going to independent black media. X number of dollars, you can't say it, but I can, are going to Roland Martin Unfiltered. You have produced, supported every African-American cause. You have folks on every GD day just about um, what's up, what's in it. And I'm not talking about you, 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 Roland. I'm talking about what's in it for us. Most of us know that you speak to black America. So you need about a million, two million, maybe three million uh, there at Roland Martin Unfiltered. But not only that, we need to stand up for ourselves. I don't want to re I don't want to um, withdraw black votes from Democrats at this time, I will leave the country if the orange man, seriously, I got two trunks in my living room. If the orange man is elected president, I'm up out of here. I'm 70. I can't do this spit no more. Um, however, that's not the point. We don't want to withdraw our votes, but we want to be appreciated. If you announce well, a $30 million ad buy Who's getting the money? Here's uh, McCongo. This is the CBS story right here. Uh, first, hold on, folks. Um, let me pull it up first. Give me a second. Don't, nope, nope. Wrong. Don't come. Don't go yet. I'm switching up. I'm switching uh, uh, iPads here. Okay. Uh, this is the story from CBS. It says his campaign announced the six weeks advertising campaign Friday with a buy that exceeds its total spending in 2023, signaling a shift to the general election. The ads will run on TV and also on radio through black and Hispanic owned outlets as well as on digital platforms. There will also be specific buys geared towards the March Madness NAACP college basketball tournament this month. Now, to Julian's, to Julian's point uh, on McCongo, um, this is a, um, uh, give me one second, this is a press release uh, that went out in uh, 2000 and, all right, give me one second, because I, I want to share it. Uh, this is the press release that went out in 2020.
Now, uh, the date on this press release uh, is August 6, uh, 2020. Go to my iPad. And so it says, yesterday, Biden for president announced a $280 million general election paid media reservation across TV, digital, and radio outlets targeting 15 key battleground states. Well, if you go down in, now, and then you see here, they tout the reservations will include historic investments to reach key constituencies, including African Americans, Latinos, Asian American Pacific Islanders. Uh, and then is the, 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 this is the key. This includes a massive eight-figure multimedia investment in African American paid media. And so you see in here, they mention NNPA, Urban One Network, they mention uh, Shade Room, and then they said numerous uh, digital media outlets. They said, and so this planned investment builds on an earlier six-figure buy that was one of the earliest ever investments in African American media for a presidential race. So then when you go down uh, in, in this particular uh, item here, so they touted uh, the various folks, different quotes in here saying this is great. Okay. So, but once we got into it, most of that mo money was not going to black-owned media. It was going to BuzzFeed, which, uh, which then owned Complex. It was going to iHeartRadio. It was going to BET, which is Viacom. Okay? And it actually was a total of $6 million out of $280 million. Here's the problem, Omicongo, that they now have. African Americans, the further you get away from the civil rights movement, fewer African Americans identify as Democrats. Black voter participation has gone down since 2008. So that's 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22. So you got that issue. And so the reality is they're going to have to spend more money to reach African Americans because you now have to micro-target African Americans. The old model, and we keep saying this, and I'm telling you, the white consultants of the Democratic Party had better wake up. The old model to reach black voters is gone. You do not have a strong infrastructure of the NAACP on the ground. You do not have uh, a strong black church infrastructure that you used to have. You would not, the voting groups are younger. They're not necessarily going to church. You're going to have to micro-target African Americans who are economic voters, African Americans who are social voters, African Americans uh, in terms of black men. You've got to have a very clear, targeted, deep, deeply rooted program targeting black men. I don't think they fully understand you can't run the same campaign in 24 that you ran in 2016, 2012, and 8 with Obama. Absolutely. And, you know, my, my daughter is actually going to be voting in her first election this year. And we have all these conversations about politics. And I don't hear anything about any targeting that's happening towards her in her in her social media spaces or, or networks and things that she watches. I think one of the challenges that the Biden administration is, is, is going to have is that they are going to spend more time going after Nikki Haley's voters and, you know, independent voters and neglect a large portion of, of the black community. And like you said, when it comes to the black community, primarily targeting those who are older in church, you know, the quote unquote civil rights legacy type voter. And as you said before, you know, many young black people are not identifying with that on many levels. They have economic interests, business, and nothing that our older community doesn't. But what I'm saying is they don't resonate on the same level. And you also see Trump and, and, and his party, they're creating all of these other images that, you know, even though they got these fake AI-generated images and the sneakers and so on and so forth, at the very least is generating a conversation about how to target young black people. And the Biden administration has to do a better job in getting with that program. And if you said $6 million out of $280 million, yeah, that was... Us. And, and, in 2020. Look, 2020, and, and, right? look, and I, I have no problem saying it. We submitted a $2 million proposal. Uh, they came back and uh, literally said, hey, you know, we can give $20,000 to four black papers. Are they happy? I said, well, that ain't us. Uh, the eventual ad spend, then they came back at 100. I said, no. They came back at 200. And they said, final was 300. And I said, yes. And I, then I blasted them afterwards. They were like, well, you blasted us. I said, oh, I'm sorry. You thought I was happy with 300? The mm -hmm. answer is no. And so, mm -hmm. again, what I, was trying to, what I keep trying to articulate to them, the black voter is different. And I'm telling right. you, folks are not understanding this. Uh, 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 Teresa, you're there in Philadelphia. You're one of the battleground states. Are you hearing black-owned media getting any of this $30 million? Well, yeah, I have two hats. Um, also, 
working with the Pennsylvania Democratic Party. So I, I am hearing they are getting it. And we actually, because I'm actually in the room for these conversations, are actually targeting local black independent papers here in the city of Philadelphia and other smaller counties across the Commonwealth. So, but I agree with your point, Roland. There has to be someone like you on the national they, uh, scale when they are putting these budgets together and not just thinking of just an easy, like it's easy to give to Viacom, it's easy to give to the Griots, it's easy to give to these major um, national media outlets versus uh, dealing with the local ones because they hit a lot of targeted areas, but the targeted areas isn't really reaching our people and our communities. That's why in Pennsylvania, we made sure that our targeted approach was having the the regional ones, but also the local papers, because the local papers um, are also still putting boots on the ground. Yeah. They're still, you know, dropping it in corner stores. They're still, you know, uh, making sure it's at your doorstep versus the other ones who, you know, say, hey, we're cutting costs because of circulation. They, you know, if, if they cut out of a certain district or a neighborhood, you're also losing out on that information. And, so, and, and, uh, and Teresa, again, this is an election about the margins. Listen, yeah. don't take my word for it. If you call Virginia House Speaker Don Scott, uh, we work with them. We did five town halls, broadcast the show. He said thousands of people were watching. He said, he said the work that we did played a huge part in them retaking the House. And so this is not just about what we do. Uh, you've got Earn Your Leisure. You've got other black podcasts out there. You've got other black digital outlets. You've got other black-owned media outlets. And so, again, what I'm trying to explain to, to folks uh, on this show as well, when I see these polls, I understand that because I've probably been in 20 cities since MLK Day. And I know what I'm hearing in those 20 cities. I'm talking to regular, ordinary people. I'm not talking to political people and folks with money. They have a problem. And they have a problem with the couch. And they have to fight the couch. Uh, there were three PACs that announced that they're going to be spending some $30 million reaching African Americans, uh, uh, Latinos, Asian American, Pacific Islanders. Uh, Quentin Brown is a co-founder of Collective PAC. He joins me in the studio. Uh, and Quentin, uh, you know, th th this thing is real. When you study the numbers, when you, when you go to these states, look, in Texas, with Beto running in 2022, 75% of young people under 30 did That's not true. vote, okay? There was a 50,000 voter drop-off in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Those 50,000 folks vote in 2022, like they did 18? Mandela Barnes is U.S. Senator. And you get the Congress, right? Right, and, and, right, and, right. And, you, and, and you get the Congress. And so, it, it's, so my deal is, I hope folks at the DNC and the Biden campaign are paying attention to what we're talking about mm -hmm. because we're actually in these communities. And I'm telling you right now, what I am hearing and seeing will be fewer black folks mm -hmm. voting in 2024 than who voted in 2022. That's the problem. He's going to need every available vote, a black vote, especially Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Michigan, mm -hmm. and Wisconsin. Exactly. And listen, that's why these three groups came together for a historic endorsement. Uh, usually endorsements happen in August, September, towards the election. We wanted to come out early in March and say we are coming out first to say we want to stand with Joe Biden. We know he has the record, right? We have the receipts on what he's done for our community. But to your point, our community doesn't know about it, right? They, they haven't heard these things from the campaign. And so we really think that the campaign, in our opinion, started after the State of the Union, right? This past weekend, folks were kind of feeling a little energized. They saw the State of the Union. They, they, they think Joe Biden did a good job, which we do, too. Um, and so we were in Atlanta this past weekend with Senator Warnock, with Senator Alsop, with, with Mayor Dickens. Um, and I can tell you, there is energy building on the ground since last Thursday. This uh, commitment for $30 million in an ad buy, I think, is a, a first step in this process. But, Roland, we agree. We have to make sure that black voters understand uh, what Joe Biden has done. They need to hear it from black media. And so it's going to be really critical that we partner together with you and others. Um, and part of that commitment is our own money, right? right? We are committing uh, $10 million. We're investing in Georgia alone as an organization to make sure, again, um, that people uh, not only know of the receipts that we have, but that we're uh, doing it and communicating with folks the right way, right? So black newspapers, uh, black digital shows like yours and others, it's going to be really critical to our ability to win this election. And see, this is the piece that, that is, I think is hard for consultants to understand. 
You can run ads all day. Mm -hmm. You can run TV and radio ads. But you simply do not have the time in a 30-second or a 60-second spot to actually explain policy. Exactly. To actually explain this got done, this got done, this got done. Mm -hmm. And that's why I, I sort of frame it that, 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 that the campaign should be thinking about an education and enlightenment strategy where you literally are going into various cities and towns. You gotta hit rural Georgia. Mm -hmm. You gotta hit rural North Carolina. Explaining done this, 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 this. We're gonna chat uh, in a moment with uh, with Higher Heights uh, and look, Terrence Woodbury with his strategies. He's laid out okay. in his own research in the focus groups. When you explain to black people what's actually been done, mm -hmm. it completely changes their perspective. Exactly. But if you don't actually take the time to explain it, you're not gonna get them. And I'm telling you, the biggest thing that, that the Biden folks, Biden Harris campaign is fighting mm -hmm. is the couch. Exactly, exactly. Listen, we know that in many of these states, the election was decided by 10,000, 20,000 votes. And so it's gonna be at the margins, to your point. We don't have the advantage of leaving voters behind. We have to bring every voter to the table, and it's gonna take a massive education and, and media and ground game. We gotta do everything. We don't have the, 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 the kind of, uh, you know, uh, privilege of kind of sitting back and thinking that folks are gonna come to us. That's not going to happen. Um, and I heard uh, one of the uh, commenters mentioned, you know, going after Nikki Haley voters and those kind of never Trumpers. Listen, the Biden coalition is going to be big. It's going to be broad. But we can't focus on one group and not, you know, give the attention to base voters like black voters the way that we need to. And I don't want to run past what you used to, again, what people don't understand. The numbers are the numbers. Donald Trump won the presidency in 2016 because of 77,000 votes. Exactly. 77,000 votes in three states. Mm -hmm. Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. You look at the numbers in 2020, wasn't that, it was larger, but it wasn't that large of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a victory margin with Biden-Harris. Exactly. So let's just take Georgia right here. Mm -hmm. If you look at 2020 in Georgia, you had Warnock running for the Senate, mm -hmm. ready to make history. Uh, you had uh, first African-American uh, from the South since Reconstruction, United mm -hmm. States Senator. Then you had Ossoff running as well. Mm -hmm. So you had massive energy in Georgia because they were running, and so Biden-Harris able to draft off of that. Exactly. You don't have that right. in 2024. Right. So you now have to really go in uh, and cultivate that. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a story I saw just the other day uh, that their numbers in, in Georgia are, are much lower. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a whole different view with the pandemic. Republican Kemp kept the state open. Mm -hmm. A lot of black businesses were appreciative of that. You look at the election that took taken there. So again, this is where you got to go in and you got to be on the ground. You got now. to be now. You got to be in Savannah. Mm -hmm. You got to be in Albany. You got to be in uh, all of those small towns exactly. where you got 20, 30, 40, 50,000 black folks. Mm -hmm. You cannot depend on Fulton County and Marion. No, no. I think, look, Atlanta is going to be important in the process, but I'll tell you another stat about Georgia. There are over 850,000 unregistered African Americans right now who, who are, you know, uh, eligible but not registered. And think about that. 10,000, 11,000 votes inside the election last cycle. So the power is in our community. 2.9 can... million eligible black voters in Texas. Exactly, another state, right? And the election was decided by, I think, uh, 3,000 3, votes. Well, Cruz, That's he right. only won by 2.5 points against right. Beto for down the state Senate. Exactly. You, exactly. Got, you got Representative Colin Allred running against him. Right. Biden loses North Carolina by just 2.5 points. 75,000 uh, votes. In, in 2020, there you go, 75,000 votes. Mm -hmm. And if you go look at those numbers, a lot of those rural African Americans, exactly. they never touch. Exactly, exactly. We don't have the, again, the, the privilege to leave anybody behind in this process. And so it's going to take massive investment across the board, right? in field, in digital, but also in black media. So we uh, agree with you, we stand with you. We're gonna do everything we can to make sure that uh, we're thinking about not just, again, spending money on outlets that are, you know, in white companies, right? But black owned media is gonna be really important because what we know is that black voters wanna hear from authentic, trusted messengers. Uh, and that's, what, who, that, that's who you are, that's what your uh, show is. And, and so again, we're very grateful to be here and for everything you're doing, bro. I'm gonna give y'all, so before I go to the break, I'm gonna come back and talk to Glenn the Car. I'm gonna give you something. So the Warnock campaign, mm -hmm. they were messing around in, two, in uh, 2022. Black newspapers in Georgia, in the middle of September, they had not bought one ad oh, wow. in a single black newspaper in Georgia. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until Meredith Lilly 
went from the Senate staff to the campaign was like, what in the hell is going on? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All of those, all of those black preachers that own smaller radio stations around mm -hmm. Georgia, they hadn't gotten anything. Warnock barely won. Right. I mean, what, it was like 75,000, 80 votes right. against Herschel Walker. Exactly. So, again, this is going to be a margin election. Mm -hmm. It is going to be picking off 800, 1,000, mm -hmm. 1,200, 1,500, and you're going to look up, and that's going to be 10, 15, 20, 25,000. And I'll say this last thing, though. I, I think I want to put some confidence in Joe Biden. I think Joe Biden is kind of at the stage where he's probably running his last election. And I think he's understanding that he has to do things a little bit differently this time. He's not going to be able to depend on, you know, the kind of his uh, uh, history of being old Joe that we love. You know, right. He's going to have to do some things differently. Well, here's the deal. So, my, my focus ain't on Joe. Because mm -hmm. let's just be honest. Candidates don't run campaigns. Yeah, Problem is, have to. are those campaign strategists or the folks who are making the decisions, are they listening? Mm -hmm. And... Are they listening to the black folks in the campaign? Right. right. Are they listening to the listening to Vice President Kamala Harris? Mm -hmm. Are they listening to the black people who are around Vice President Kamala Harris? Mm -hmm. Are they listening? Because at the end of the day, and, and I, I talked to enough folk mm -hmm. who've worked in, in these circles, they oftentimes they don't mm -hmm. until we get to Oct late September, October, then they're frantic. Listen to black people early. Exactly. Then you not trying to scramble late. Yeah. Hold on one second. We're going to come back. We're going to talk with the founder of Higher Heights, Black Women. They've got some concerns about this election, too. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Support us in what we do. Join our Brina Funk Fan Club. Senior Check-In Money Order. P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C. 200-37-0196. Cash App, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal are Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, rolling at rollingsmartin.com, rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. We'll be right back. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, less than 5% of the top executive positions in corporate America are held by women of color. We know it's not because of talent. A recent study says that it's microaggressions, unconscious bias, and limited opportunities being offered to women of color. On our next show, we're gonna get incredible advice from Francine Parham, who's recently written a book sharing exactly what you need to do to make it up into the management ranks and get the earnings that you deserve. I made a point to sit down and I made a point to talk to people. And I made a point to be very purposeful and thought provoking when I spoke to them. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Hey, what's up, Geek Tony? In the place to be, got Cake Touch at Mama's University, creator and executive producer of Fat Tuesdays, the air hip hop comedy. But right now, I'm rolling with Roland Martin, unfiltered, uncut, unplugged, and undamn believable. You hear me? When it comes to Democratic politics, the two biggest blocks, black women, black men, 
The numbers don't lie. Well, the folks at Higher Heights, they have been studying uh, what black women have to say, and uh, they understand the power they vote, but they also have some serious concerns. So joining us right now uh, to talk about uh, this poll that they put together, this survey they put together, uh, welcome back to the show. Of course, you know, yeah, we've had on before. Uh, she is, of course, uh, leader of Higher Heights, uh, Glenda Carr. She joins us from D.C. So, Glenda, you're the president and CEO of Higher Heights. All right. The survey you did, what does it say? So we're um, just released um, polling. We talked to 820 um, black women voters between February um, 14th and February 22nd. So this is new data. We wanted to kind of get a, a temperature check, a check of black women going into Super Tuesday and into the State of the Union. And not surprising, black women are multi-issue voters. What resonates in this polling is that black women are concerned about the economy and the pocketbook issues. 58% of black women are concerned about the rising cost of living. 35% um, of them are concerned about affordable housing. And 27% of black women are concerned about the rising cost of health care. So this poll talks about cost, 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 right? Black women want economically thriving, educated, healthy, and safe communities. This poll points to that. When forced to um, pick three issues that black women are concerned with, obviously the economy rises to the top, but they're also current concerned about gun violence um, and they're concerned about health care. So we look at so rising cost of living, so some of the issues, rising cost of living, abortion, public safety, affordable quality housing, reducing racism and discrimination. Yes. And so that's an intersectional voter. Um, so as we look at, black, uh, at candidates vying for our votes, they want to hear about the smart solutions and innovative policies that intersect at our ability to thrive in this community. And when you um, say like, candidates, we're not talking about just D.C. We're talking U.S. Senate candidates, congressional candidates, gubernatorial candidates, people running for state, state senator, state rep, all of them. Yes. And so oftentimes we get caught in a discussion about Washington, D.C. and about the top of the ticket. But there are... Um, candidates that are going to be or should be knocking on our doors, making phone calls, texting, and being in community conversations with black women. This poll also talks a little bit about, as you mentioned, that we understand our power. Um, we still feel like our vote is taken for granted. So let me dissect that anecdotally. We talk about our vote being taken for granted because this democracy is a 365-day-a-year activity. But oftentimes, um, our elected leaders and those vying for our votes will come knocking on our, literally and figuratively, knocking on our doors 14 days before the election cycle. Black women want to be active participants in this democracy. Um, and so that is not only leading into the voting booth, but leading outside of the bowling, um, voting booth. And they want to hear clear solutions and policy solutions around the issues we care about. So, Glenna, th this is what I was talking about when I was talking with Quentin uh, about why I felt uh, if you're trying to really run differently, you should have been starting, frankly, nine months ago. Uh, because it's a lot of stuff that happened, a lot of stuff that got passed, but you gotta break it down. You know, you know, may rest in peace, Joe Madison, but he would always say, you gotta put it where the goats can get it. And so you can't talk about the Inflation Reduction Act if you don't explain, okay, well, what the hell was in it? Okay, uh, build back better, what was in it? How did this impact very specific communities? Uh, I remember when the president gave uh, a speech, uh, I think it was at North Carolina A&T, uh, and I would love for you and Quentin to talk about it, I'm gonna bring my panel in as well, uh, but you first, he gave a speech to North Carolina A&T, and they still do it, $7 billion to HBCUs. I'm like, no, 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 no. That ain't how you get black folk attention. You gotta be able to say, A&T got this. Winston-Salem State, you got this. North Carolina Central, you got this. You gotta do a roll call. You gotta actually say, Florida A&M. The state gave Florida A&M X millions in 2021. We gave them four times as much money. You gotta make it plain where somebody goes, wait a minute, hold up. Florida only gave Florida A&M $40 million and y'all gave them 200 million? That's something somebody can relate to. That, to me, is, I think, how you have to explain to not just black voters, but all voters, what you have done. Glenda, you first, then Quentin. 
Yeah, I, absolutely. I was um, recently with Senator um, Raphael Warnock, and he's been shifting how he talks to black women. Um, so he's recently been in some large rooms with black women, um, some um, black women, um, you know, um, sorority conferences. And what he said is instead of, you know, talking about um, talking about student loan debt um, forgiveness, he literally says, do you know anyone that has seen their debt relief? And he said, Every single, almost every single person in that room may not have affected me, but right. I know someone that was able to do that. He then said there were two, like women with two hands up. Not only did I benefit from it, but I know someone in my family or in my network. And so we have to put real life stories. That's what this poll points to. There you go. Poll points to that black women realize that they are seeing more black women in um, elected and appointed um, leadership. Um, and so that is the strength. Sending out vice President Kamala Harris to talk about reproductive freedom and the lived experience as a woman and a black woman is a winning strategy. Being able to have, you know, candidates and surrogates talk about how um, this economy affects and what we need to do to move this country forward and not backward, backwards, we have to be good storytellers. Quentin, if I Biden Harris, I ain't speaking nowhere unless I got five people in the audience who got student loan debt relief. Right, exactly. I I'm shouting them out in every speech. <laughs> it, it, and look, I, I think, you know, part of our endorsement this weekend is, is we're going to see over the next few weeks a real rollout of a, a, a messaging kind of program around the accomplishments, to your point. We've been telling them, you know, you have actual frame that you can work with right now. You know, it starts with our health. Right, they've lowered prescription drug costs, thirty-five dollars for insulin. They've helped uh, raise the insurance uh, rate of African Americans to the highest levels that we we, we know. Uh, our health, our wealth, our wallets, our rights—they have a frame to work with. But to your point, you got to break that down for folks. We're no, you know, so wherever you're driving to to Georgia, or North Carolina, you got to break those things down. And if you send the thirty-five dollars, you got to say sixty-eight thousand African Americans in Georgia, or exactly. whatever the number is. Exactly. I mean that 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 makes it personal. It does, it does. And I think we're going to start to see that as the campaign kind of gets into gear up over the next few weeks. But I think the, the, the good thing about this role, and I will say, they have accomplished a lot for our communities. It's just the fact that they are messaging in it, you know, and they, they haven't been doing that. But we have a story to tell. And to Glenn's point, we got to do it around stories. we got to do it in our, our, our uh, kind of black vernacular, right? This kind of point that I've been making with them is we got the receipts. Right? You have a record to run on. We don't want to kind of, you know, frame this as Joe Biden has delivered for black people. No, Joe Biden has receipts for our community, right? And how do we actually begin to roll that out in a way to where it connects with people, where they are, where they live, where they work, where they go to school? Linda, in, in, the, in the poll that y'all did, uh, let me go to the panel next, did, did Terrence do the same thing with these sisters he did with black women? Say, uh, uh, they said this, but then when reciting the accomplishments, did their perspective change? We actually, this poll was to do a baseline to touch point on what they're interested in. We are at higher heights. We'll be spending the year, as you know, um, African African Americans sometimes are not um, represented in polling, particularly polling that is not um, commissioned and designed for and by black people. And so higher heights commitment in this cycle to make sure we not only are we from <clears throat> a polling perspective, but focus group perspective, talking to black women voters um, consistently in this election cycle, because we need to be limber, right? Just like yep. the world changes um, in the way that we, black women are being um, targeted by mis and disinformation, we actually need to be armed with um, how that is impacting them. Um, as relates to the, the discussion around how are we spending our money, as you know, um, black women, um, based on our poll, are getting their news from lo local news, um, ABC, CBS, NBC News, and social media, right? Um, that is where you come into play, right, Roland, is like, how are we investing in and making sure that we are engaging black women across um, across um, age, right, intergenerational, that we are not only combating the mis yep. misinformation that is coming towards us, that we are, in fact, being the go-to places there you with go. actual information for and by black people. Well, the Black Pack poll showed that African Americans were getting lots of negative messaging on Biden-Harris from social media, which is why I keep saying you got to have hand-to-hand -hand combat. When the folks are posting that, you got to literally be in comments. Wrong. That's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie, and dropping the factual information. Uh, Macongo, your first, your, your first up question for uh, Glenda Quinton. Go ahead. Yes, uh, my question is for, for you, Ms. Carr. In your polling that you did, 
with, with all of these uh, black women, was the question ever brought up or was there any responses related to this argument about the overall threat to democracy? All of these news stations are always talking about Biden needs to run on that. He needs to run on, you know, Trump's an existential threat to democracy. Is this something that's resonating with, with the black women that you polled? Yeah, the poll does point to that people are concerned about our democracy, right? The um, protecting of their vote, um, free and fair elections um, is a touch point. Um, when you look at the data, it is, it is literally the top six issues are split almost evenly. I think black women know that this this democracy in our country is, is literally on fire, right? And that we can't just put all our eggs into one basket. They are concerned about education and CRT. They're concerned about, you know, um, fair elections and their vote continuing to count. Um, and so it is about, as Quentin mentioned, that we are going to hone in on the messaging that will resonate among African Americans, but we also aren't a monolith. Right. Um, and so we oftentimes are being messaged in a way that is very broad. Um, we want our, you know, this release of a public poll um, is to be able to use by our, you know, colleagues um, and, um, you know, groups <coughs> that may not be able to host their own polls to yep. go, how do we like hone in on message? They, our counterparts spend a lot of time talking about what is the message for swing voters, <laughs> right? There's a lot of nuances on how to talk to swing voters. This election cycle is going to be about them understanding how sophisticated black voters are and that we're demanding them to, to, to raise their bar on how they're going to talk to us and, frankly, how we talk to each other. Um, our most effective um, messenger, right, when you fire up a black woman and give her the tools and the information, she doesn't go to the polls alone. She brings her house, her block, her church, her sorority, and her union. And polls like this and the work that, you know, our partners do yep. at um, Collect Pack is that we're going to be very targeted about how we talk to and engage and motivate black voters this cycle. And, Quentin, the point Glenn just made, how you talk to us, the, the threat to democracy doesn't resonate with us. They're closing our polling locations. Uh, they, that's being very specific, which is a threat to democracy, but you gotta talk that way. Yeah, exactly. Like, black people know that democracy really hasn't ever worked for us in this country. <laughs> right, right. Right, and so like, it's always... We get that. It's always been broken, and so framing it that way, is, to your point, is not uh, detailed enough, right? But talk about January 6th, right, an insurrection. We understand what trying to overthrow the government looks and like. And they were mad about four, four, uh, four, four uh, cities. Exactly. Atlanta, mm -hmm. Philadelphia... Milwaukee, Detroit. Exactly. That was the cornerstone of January 6th. Mm -hmm. what Trump kept saying those four places. What are those four places? Black cities. Black cities. Exactly. And you, you, know, you think about the other side, right? 91 criminal charges. We know what, you know, uh, uh, not serving your time looks like. We know what you trying to run from charges looks like. So you got to break things down in a very different way. And I think if we figure out a way to do that, Roland, I think we'll be very successful, but we got to do it. We can't talk about these overarching things. No. We got to dig in to the real issues. Look, look we, we do it every day. So <laughs> it's, but again, it's having messages who know how to talk to our people. Uh, Teresa, your question for Glenda Quinton. Yes. Um, in your polling, did you ever uh, ask the question of who are these women going to vote for overall? We have not deep dived in that. Um, what we found in this poll is that overwhelmingly um, black women are um, interested in engaging in this election cycle. Um, they are concerned about their vote being taken for granted. Um, that means there's work to be done. Um, if you talk about it from a political lens, we now, in theory, have a, you know, we have a presumptive, you know, nom like we know who, uh, who our nominees on both sides are going to be. So we now have time to talk about um, motivating black women. Mm -hmm. Of course, based on um, age, younger um, voters are less likely to be ready to vote in the cycle. So there's work to be done. Uh, hold, and Glenda, um, your poll, how, how do you, will you identify younger? Is it 1835, 1839, 1845? I'm gonna put that up for you right now. All right. It is, it's based on, um, as you know, Terrence um, Woodbury did this work. And so there is this notion of your boomers and your Gen Xers. Um, you have your, your, your millennial, I'm gonna talk about, um, Quentin, your older millennials <laughs> versus kind of this, this in between of a, a, a Gen Z and a, an, um, uh, a, a, a Gen Z and a cusp, 
millennial. Right, right. Uh, and so it varies drastically. What we now have is, right, in, in two primary we have a two new voting, very strong voting blocks, and that's what I'm calling them. You have uncommitted, which is a voting block that is being organized and funded, and then you have those who are saying they're staying at home. Right. I call that. I call that the couch voters. Mm -hmm. And that's a vote. That is a very growing, strong voting block, right? And there is a discussion and motivation, and that that crosses. Um, age demographics, yes. right? There yes. are people across age demographics that believe that they can't vote in the cycle, they can't vote for a Biden, and so they're sitting at home. Now, that's a conscious decision, but we need to spend some time talking about that. That is a conscious decision. Yes. That is not just you. That is a growing voting block. Yep. So at the end of the day, when you are sitting there, rolling, what did you call it, a couch voter? Yeah. Um, that you are actually impacting this election cycle. Yes. Um, and so you will have to live with that consequence on be the be other side. Because what I say, say Glenda... Like women fat out. Because what I say is, when our vote decreases, what then happens is you actually are making th their votes actually go up. And so the reason black turnout was so great in 08, it actually canceled out. Black turnout goes here, and white voters were pretty much uh, right here. So it canceled out a lot of those particular votes. Obama won North Carolina by 14,100 votes. Biden loses North Carolina by 2.5 points. Look at the numbers. Black voters went down, and then all of a sudden, the margin of victory goes up. That's what you're speaking to. Yep. And at the end of the day, we these national people don't think their vote matters. 2020... 2016 has proven, in particularly a presidential cycle, that every single vote matters and the margins are so low, um, like narrow, that you just sitting some out. So there is the, I'm sitting out, self-identify sitting out. At the end of the day, there is, there is um, a concentrated effort, right? Just as Quentin and, um, you know, our colleagues at um, Voto Latino, um, people who are investing in bringing um, bringing out Black and Latino and Asian voters, there is a counter narrative of people spending millions of dollars yep. to depress that vote. Yep, and that's right. a part of the whole deal, this whole d democracy piece here, uh, uh, Quentin. And and then this thing ain't anecdotal. No, it's real. It's sitting right there, so you got to confront it. Exactly, and and I think. Um... What we started to see, I think, last Thursday, say the union, is him being a little bit more aggressive, right, coming directly from the candidate. To your point, though, that has to trickle down to your comms team, to your digital team. Everybody has to be on the same page around punching back and being really yep. direct around what's going to happen. Yep. Um, you know, he, he's calling out things that are happening wrong with, uh, you know, immigration or, or democracy or, you know, who Trump's hanging out with, right? He's hanging out with other dictators. That's going to be really critical that we kind of point those things out, but we bring it home to where folks can connect. And with. then you're talking about Josh Stein running against uh, uh, Mark Thompson in North Carolina. Right, exactly. Listen, you got to pay attention to Sherrod Brown trying to get reelected in Ohio, Ohio because if he loses in Ohio, Tessa loses in Montana, guess what? Republicans not control the Senate. Now you're not getting more of those black judges. Exactly. Now you're not getting the agenda through if the Republicans control the House. Mm -hmm. And so this is also where connecting the dots matter. Julian, your question for Glenda. Linda, um, I'm looking at your poll. It looks great. Thanks for your hard work. I have a question about the priorities and how we're drilling down on them. Uh, you said 58% care about housing. You're looking at gun violence. You're looking at economic issues. What kind of education is um, Higher Heights or other organizations doing to make sure people understand why and how they're voting? Just using those buzzwords I don't think works for a lot of voters who are not fully engaged. What's the education piece? Yeah. Um, thank you for that um, question. I think it is the notion of storytelling, right? This allows us, this poll was very targeted towards media and stakeholders um, and those political junkies like me who like to, you know, have the data behind this. It didn't surprise me that black women are multi-issue voters, that black women are concerned. Like, I am a black woman. I know what I'm concerned with. I know what makes me... Uh, um, you know, not sleep at night or wake up in the middle of the night. Our work at higher heights over the next, you know, um, couple of months as we drive in is actually being your go-to place for and by black women to provide, um, to for black women to be informed, engaged, and to take action. Um, and, and do it in a way that every day my cousin, 
um, to my best friend in Atlanta will be able to have the information they need um, to not only protect their vote, but more importantly, have those important conversations at dinner tables with um, the men in their lives, with the young women in their lives, in a way that says, this is how the country has been moving forward. Here is what may happen. Um, we have a real, we are fighting for the literally um, what our grandparents fought for. And so we are at a crossroads in this, you know, in this democracy and being able to talk about it in a way that resonates um, is, is the work ahead. And that's what Higher Heights will be doing over um, the next six months is ensuring that we are giving real life um, information, connecting with real black women telling their stories, um, and more importantly, connecting them to black women running for office and black women who are in elected office to be able to talk about when they go, when, when, my, my, when my friends sit at brunch and say, well, one, my vote doesn't matter or it doesn't affect my day-to-day -day life. Um, the notion, as you know, Juliana Wright, is that every single thing we do from the light bulb out in front of our house to if we have a, a pothole in front of our house is tied to a public policy yep. that is tied to an elected official that you chose to vote for and not vote for. Uh, and I know this ain't gonna happen, but uh, it's interesting uh, how mainstream media talked all this stuff about all these polls in black people. Yet when Black Pack dropped their poll last week, none of them called. They only talked to us. So let's see who calls uh, you at higher heights, uh, uh, Glenda. Because again, they keep talking about black people and all these other polls where we represent a small sample. Here, y'all talk to just black women. Collective uh, 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 black pack talk to just black people, black men and black women, and they don't want to talk about those polls. So I always find that to be real interesting, but that's also why we got to have uh, black-owned media. Uh, Glenda, we appreciate it. Uh, keep us abreast of what's next. Will do. Uh, Quentin, it's going to be, it's, it's, it's a long, it's a long, long game here. But what I keep saying is, again, we got to be constantly educated. Mm -hmm. Just this is what happened. <laughs> this is what's going on. Mm -hmm. And this is what will happen. Because I'm going to do a whole two-hour show on Project 225. Mm -hmm. Our folk got to really understand what MAGA has planned mm -hmm. if they win. Exactly. And, and I think the other thing that we're not talking about is their plan really is to have an election decided by Congress. And if, yes. and if we don't make Hakeem Jeffries the Speaker of the House, it doesn't matter if Joe Biden wins if they try to hold up the transition of power in Congress. Well, well actually, what they're doing is they're funding RFK. Mm, exactly. uh, and, what, and what they're hoping, they're hoping that if Biden, they want to keep Biden under 270. Exactly. And if, if it's under 270, people don't understand. Mm -hmm. It goes to the House of Representatives. Right. Which Republicans control. Exactly, exactly. So... Understanding, connecting the dots. Mm -hmm. Quentin, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you for yeah, having me on. Bro. Folks, when we come back, Joe Rogan, Christopher Rufo, they actually said that Karine Jean-Pierre, she got her job because of identity, because they don't like the, how she performs her job. Y'all notice white people never, ever say that somebody white got a job because they're white? I've got a couple of things to say. And Senator Tim Scott, he says, Trump is going to get 40% of the black male vote. Do they have mandatory drug testing in the United States Senate? You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Side Network. For the last 15 or maybe 16 years, 18 years, I'll say, since I, when I moved to L.A., I hadn't had a break. I hadn't had a vacation. I had a week vacation here and there. Right. This year, after I got finished doing Queen Sugar and we wrapped it up, because I knew I had two TV shows coming on at the same time, mm -hmm. so I'm going to take a break. So I've been on break for the first time, and I can afford it. Praise right. God. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I can afford it. I'm like, I can right. sit back and ain't got nothing to worry about, man. But this was the first time in almost in, in two decades wow. that I've actually had time to sit back wow. and, and, and smell the roses. <laughs> Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. Democracy in the United States is under siege. On this list of bad actors, it's easy to point out the Donald Trumps, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, or even the United States Supreme Court as the primary villains. But as David Pepper, author, scholar, and former politician himself says, there's another factor that trumps them all and resides much closer to many of our homes. 
His book is Laboratories of Autocracy, a wake-up call from behind the lines. So these state houses get hijacked by the far right, then they gerrymander, they suppress the opposition, and that allows them to legislate in a way that doesn't reflect the people of that state. David Pepper joins us on the next Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Hello, we're the Critter Fixers. I'm Dr. Bernard Hodges. And I'm Dr. Terrence Ferguson. And you're tuned in to Roland Martin Unfiltered. It's always interesting when white Americans love to call out black and other minorities and suggest that we only got into college because of our race and we only got a job because of our race and, oh, uh, that job was mine, but they had to hire the black person. But they never, ever say that when the person is white. Joe Rogan and Christopher Rufo, you know, he was the one who was attacking CRT. Christopher Rufo, the one who went after the, ha- the sister at Harvard. So they were having a conversation, and uh, they were critical of White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre. Here's some of their conversation. It's, it's, <laughs> it is interesting that he's so frail that he's transparent, right? And he's so transparent to the point where uh, the White House press secretary accidentally tweeted as him from her account. You saw that. Yeah. Right. Which is wonderful. I love when that happens because it's like, thank you. I was wondering. And now I know, you know, I I was really confused. (laughs) I kind of had a feeling it was you, you know, and is is there ever been a worse White House press secretary? She's it's how how did she get that job? She's so bad at convincing people. There's there's a bunch of like hardcore, ideologically driven left-wing pundits that are on YouTube that could do a way better yeah. job. And they would be fucking psycho about it. Yeah. They would be psycho about it, and the left would be like, yeah! yeah. Like, she's not the one. Yeah. Like, she's fucking terrible at it. She gets called out for stuff all the time. She gets set up for stuff all the time. Like, Peter Ducey's always setting her up. He talks to her, but he, Deucey's he'll, amazing. He's, yeah. he's so good. He'll provide a little bit of this, but then what about that? Yeah. And, you know, she's just awful at it. And, and she's only really challenged by one person. Right. In the briefing room and yeah. still manages to bungle it on the daily. Well, it's just there's but so much madness that this, she has to, like, cover up. It's what – and look, this is, again, a, a kind of brass tacks way of talking about it, but it's what happens when you put identity over competence. Yeah. Everyone knows, like, explicitly. And then when you hire someone, it's a big celebration of all the different intersectional identities the, the, the candidate has. Yeah. You know, this is our first, you know, black, female, I don't know, LGBTQ, not really sure. Yeah. Um, and, and so the, the, the problem with that, though, is when you're not making a decision based on competence, merit, excellence, you're buying into it at the front end on that different hierarchy of decision making. But then on the back end, you can't do anything about it. You say, well, you elevated this person for identity. You can't fire that person because of incompetence. Unless they steal women's clothes from the airport. Yeah, unless, exactly. <laughs> unless they get a little sideways, you know. That guy was my favorite. But the, the Harvard story is this exact yes. phenomenon. Ah, so don't you love Joe Rogan, who somehow uh, can't identify any facts whatsoever by saying, oh, my God, she actually was uh, tweeting for Joe Biden. Go to my iPad. Hey, Joe, since you think you're so damn smart, this is Dan Scavino. Do you know who Dan Scavino is? He was the one who often was tweeting for Donald Trump. Yep, yep, he often was tweeting, tweeting for Trump, okay? You got to be an idiot, Joe, to not realize that not all candidates and office holders actually post everything on their social media. Duh, they have staff, okay? So to act like, oh, this is just Karine Jean-Pierre is stupid. But see, the issue for me is not, I'm not going to, issue for me is not even in this discussion, Karine Jean-Pierre. If you don't like her, that's up to you. You don't like her. So they clearly don't like her performance. Don't like what she's doing, how she does her job. But here's what I'm focusing on. I'm focusing on how Joe and Rufo 
One, oh, this is identity. This is identity. And so when they said that, and I've said this beforehand, y'all notice, you never hear anybody white ever say, you know, you got in, got into school because you're white. You know, you got this job because you're a white woman. You know, you got this job because you're a white man. You know why? Because see, when they say identity, do you know what it means? It means black, Latino, Asian American, Native American, woman, LGBT. Identity for them is never white men. Oh, it's never white men. But we all know some absolutely awful, mediocre white men and white women who've gotten jobs, major jobs. In fact, the previous Oval Office occupant had a host of people working for him who were utterly incompetent. And nearly all of them were white. In fact, he was unqualified. Donald Trump was a grossly unqualified white man who had no business in the job. But I use the word unqualified because I want to help you all out here. See, here's what they do. They only use the qualifier qualified when talking about us. See, so they automatically, they automatically assume when it comes to whiteness that they are qualified. That's what they do. And so, it's no, and I know somebody's going to say, well, Roland, you can't call, you can't say that Joe Rogan is a racist. I didn't call him a racist. But he's pretty damn racial. And so is Rufo. See, they don't even realize when their whiteness comes through. Even in that conversation. See, if you believe that Corrine Jean-Pierre is awful at her job, just say she's awful. Just say she's bad. But the moment you go to identity, now that changes the conversation. And again, I would love for anyone to show me where Christopher Rufo and Joe Rogan has ever said, man, that white guy is awful. He clearly got that job because he's a white guy, because he's a golf buddy with so-and-so, because he's a tennis buddy with so-and-so, because he sucks up to so-and-so. But that never happens. And all the black folks I know, and y'all watching and listening, y'all know how this goes. They always are trying to label us thinking we are a bunch of Clarence Thomases who, who will then be, oh my God, they criticized me. They called me a diversity hire. They said I got into school because of affirmative action. Let me help you out, Joe Rogan and Christopher Rufo the greatest beneficiary of affirmative action in American history. Actually, white men. The second group that's benefited from affirmative action is white women. Now, officially, affirmative action benefited white women. But that was a book that detailed when affirmative action was white. And all of these programs and opportunities they were afforded to white men after World War II, GI Bill, numerous contracts. We can go down the line. We see it every day. How many white men got hooked up with COVID contracts by Trump just because Jared said, give it to him? I don't recall you, Joe, or Christopher calling them out for their identity. Hmm. It's amazing how y'all never, ever question white identity, but you sure question identity for other people. We'll go to my panel here. Start with you, Teresa. And we all know the game. And we know exactly how they do it. And so I'm going to hit them every time by saying, 
please, by all means, show me when you call out whiteness. They never do because they automatically assume they're always qualified and they always are excellent at the job. Yeah, and I think that's the most disrespectful thing, um, especially when we think about being black in America and what that looks like. I've never been a fan of Joe Rogan um, and Chris due to probably the two years ago when um, on their podcast they had over 20 uh, episodes uh, where they used the N-word and also compare black communities to the planet of the apes. And even with that, which I'm hoping Spotify is not on this $30 million um, spend, but even with that, um, it's, it, it's troubling that, you know, as many folks, you know, get canceled for saying, you know, racial slurs and, you know, disrespect, these folks still continue to remain in our space. They continue to make monies off the backs of what we're doing. Um, as it relates to Corinne, she is qualified. She has been in the position um, to lead the voice of the administration. But the ignorance of Joe Rogan and Chris that, you know, only, you know, the, the president in real time can tweet his own, that's just, again, them going backwards, them being prehistoric on how they use journalism and lack thereof. So, you know... The identity thing, basically, to me, you know, my 34 years of living always has said um, that we don't belong um, and we never really were supposed to have these positions. So I'm not sure if I, I hear it as, identi as identity, but more so as just a racial slur. Well, see, the, see, the, the reason I'm pointing this out, uh, Julian, because I want people watching and listening to learn to listen differently. And I, this, I've been calling this out for years. It's no different than somebody uh, seeing me in my Texas A&M uh, gear and go, did you play football? H how did you arrive at that <laughs> conclusion? That is a racial assumption. Because I know what they're actually yeah. saying. Oh, black guy, look like uh, Stocky Bill, oh, you went to a white school? Oh, y'all, you can only have gone there because you played football. But what they do here, and this happens everywhere, this happens in law firms, it happens in corporate America, happens in Silicon Valley, is what they do is w w w when white folks don't like somebody, oh, yeah, you only got your job because you're black. I mean, I used to get these emails from white folks all the time when I was at CNN. Uh, you're not qualified to be there, and I'm going, fool, you can't even spell resume. <laughs> you know, Roland, if you want a good laugh, back in the day when I used to do CNN, MIT would call me, uh, they would always, you know, refer to me as an MIT trade economist. MIT got more calls on me than j there was one other person than anybody else. Does she really have a degree there? I mean, they would call MIT alumni office to check my credentials, uh, which was cray-cray to the cray-cray, and to the point that they had a little three-by-five card to say, if they ask you about Malvo, yeah, she went here. She finished in 80. You know, uh, so this happens all the... Here's the deal. Credentials and qualifications for all of these people, the norm is white male. And anybody who deviates from that norm, black woman, white woman, GBLTQIA person, if you deviate from the norm, then there are going to be questions raised. You got your job because you were. Fill in the blank. No, you got your job because you were qualified. Because quite frankly, any of us who got those jobs understood that we would be scrutinized, that we would be, would be looked at closely, and our credentials would be questioned. But so this conversation around Kareem is a stupid conversation. It's stupid because she, first of all, worked under Jen Shockey, who everybody loves. And Jen Shockey is the one who recommended Kareen, who was her number two person. Is this not white American meritocracy? Number one gives up for number two. And Kareen has done a great job. Now, I, 
if, if I were having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her, which I, I adore her, we're, we're friendly, um, I'd say, come, come a little harder. But guess what? If she came a little harder, what kind of other splash would we get? These white, these ignorant white boys simmering in their privilege have the temerity to attempt to tear down a black woman, which seems to be the sport of the day in these United States. Fannie Willis, Barbara Lee, we can call the role. And so these white boys, and I couldn't call them men because they are boys. Not only are boys, they're stupid white boys. They're out of order, out of line, out of control. And they believe that they are the, the center and the rest of them are the margin. Uh, and here's the deal. I mean, let's just be clear on Macongo. Um, do we want to say Clarence Thomas got picked because of identity? Mm. See, again, mm. though, they I never, they never want to do that. But again, you have never, you never hear white folks say, oh, that, per yeah, they got that job because they're a white man. No, they only use that language when it applies to non-white people. Absolutely. And I see this across the country, whether I'm working with schools, corporations, government groups, this idea of black employees having their qualifications questioned. It's, it's a run of the mill situation. And I can go right to the Biden cabinet right now. I mean, Pete Buttigieg is part of the LGBTQ community, but nobody brings him up as being hired for that part of his identity. Nobody talks about that. And so right there in real time, you're seeing how a situation is never brought up for the white man who's in office. People don't bring up his age. They don't bring him being young. They don't bring up any of that. Those types of issues are reserved for us. And like the late Joe Madison said, rest in peace, you know, we got to read with a third eye and listen with a third ear. You know, to really understand what's being said when they drop these 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 little statements. And we have to un also understand that if we don't call people out, people who have these popular platforms like him or uh, Rogan, they get away with it. They get away with it, and it gives a permission structure for everybody else. And you went to the Trump administration, another person, like you said, who was not uncool, who was not qualified, who started his own campaign by questioning the superior qualifications of Obama with his birth or arguments and, and demanding his transcript. And when we come bring it back to Karen John, Karen John Pierre, she worked for the Biden, she worked for the Obama administration, she worked for the ACLU. She is seasoned in this work. And so with a guy like Rufo, whose only goal is to get rid of anything that recognizes us in any way, shape, or form and honors our merits, if we don't continue to speak up, they're going to continue to get away with it. And so I'm very glad, Roland, that you're trying to get people to listen beyond the basic of what's been said. Because, like you said, could have said, I'm just not feeling her. But all of that, once you go into that qualifications, uh, you know, rambling, that's when we know we got you. And Joe and yep. Teresa was saying, Rogan's got a history of this. Um, I, I was going to play this, but this lines directly up with what I'm talking about. Uh, Y'all have the Bill Maher comment? Bill Maher? Mm. Huh? All right, so on Friday's show, uh, B B Bill Maher, uh, they were talking about, you know, the campaign. They were talking about, you know, what, what they should do and, you know, Biden, all of them. Say it again. Do we have it? Okay, so they were talking about um, all they were doing and... Uh, and so Bill Maher decides to throw out uh, his idea of uh, a dream ticket. Now, he's been um, highly critical. He's been highly critical at every turn uh, of Vice President Kamala Harris. I mean, he's been criticizing her. He thinks she's awful. He thinks she's bringing nothing to the ticket. Uh, he, he, he's long said that uh, she needed to be dropped uh, from, uh, from the ticket. So... Uh, so here's what he did uh, on uh, the show on um, Friday. Listen to this comment. Um, I know it's crazy to think that she could run with Biden, but that's my dream, mm -hmm. a unity ticket. And then he would, I think, definitely win because nobody's going to. And of course, she said some crazy things. Mm -hmm. Most politicians have not as crazy as we've never been a racist country. I mean, that's pretty crazy. Wow. <laughs> literally destroy the, Repu uh, the Democratic base. I mean, take no, off the really? first African-American mm. female vice she's, president. She's office a woman again. of color. Wink, yeah, wink. but it's just like oh, black women are uh, like the yeah, core I, I of the it. Democratic Party. Um, I know it's crazy to think that she could run with Biden. But 
Mm-hmm. Bill, you're an idiot. Wow. I mean, that they're just, oh, this is my dream ticket. <laughs> first of all, first of all, you notice Mr. Always Complaining About Identity, why would you pick a woman? Why would you pick an Indian American woman? First of all, Nikki Haley disagreed with Biden on damn near every policy. Why in the hell would he pick her? Right. right. Two, oh, this is my dream ticket. See, this is one thing why I think Dems are stupid. Only Democrats entertain idiotic conversations. Hey, let's put a Republican and a Democrat together, and it'll be great. So, so y'all always notice this. When a Democrat president uh, wins, the press goes, um, are you going to seek bipartisanship and unity? Are you going to pick a Republican for your candidate? And then the dumb, then the Democrat, it's like, oh, feels like they're blocked in. They go, yeah. You won't never hit the Republican said, yes, for bipartisanship, I'm going to pick a cabinet secretary who's a Democrat. They don't do that shit. They pick a Republican every time. Yep. <laughs> so he now decides to, oh, this is my dream ticket. This is my dream ticket. And, well, it's not going to happen. Uh, this fool, Bill Maher, this, Bill, you need to make a decision. Either stick to comedy or go to school and be taught political science. If Biden even remotely entertained the thought of replacing Vice President Kamala Harris with Nikki Haley, Bill, it would guarantee a blowout. That's right. Guarantee. He ain't gonna win Georgia. He ain't gonna win North Carolina. He ain't gonna win Pennsylvania. He ain't gonna win Wisconsin. He ain't gonna win Michigan. And hell, he may end up losing Illinois. He may end up losing... That's how stupid that suggestion is. And then Bill goes, well, both of them are women of color, so aren't they just interchangeable? That's a dumbass uh, comment to say. (laughs) Real quick, uh, real quick through the panel, about 30 seconds each, Teresa, Omicongo, Julian, about that dumbass comment idea from Bill Maher. Teresa? Well, that comment is, um, unfortunately, what most uh, folks in the back rooms are thinking about. And it's very unfortunate, because if anybody even paid attention to Nikki Haley's comments uh, and concerns of how America should be ran, it is the complete opposite of President Biden. So we would just be hiring Nikki Haley for a Republican ticket. And just know, um, to your point, Roland, about, you know, Republicans do not put Democrats in their higher executive position is a true fact. And I have no idea why Democrats do say that that's how they're going to achieve bipartisanship, which, as we can see, it has not. So. When they ask that question of McCongo, a Dem president should say, hell no, I'm picking all Democrats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Period, bottom line. I mean, Democrats just got to be bold. Republicans don't care, they've, and they've made it clear. And when it comes to Bill Maher, he should go back and listen to this segment that we just had with, with Ms. Carr and, and Mr. James, because Kamala Harris is extremely popular, and people know that she's the secret weapon who he needs to get out more and have her be more, uh, you know, visible. And so Bill Maher, he's undermining her once again. This is his, his M.O., and really, at the end of the day, we got to continue to ignore him, and it would just be a disaster if Biden even got close to that. Julian? <laughs> I don't think that Biden would ever even fathom uh having Nikki Haley on his ticket. That is the funniest mess I've ever heard. Uh, (laughs) Maher overestimates his influence. He is a comedian. He funny. He ain't that funny, but he funny. But he is not a political strategist. And his dreams, uh, which would be American nightmares, have nothing to do with nothing. And Teresa's point is one we should explore uh, Democrats always want... We all, we want to play kumbaya. We want to be the nice guy. We need to stop that mess. So we, yeah, we'll put a Republican in, and we often do. When have you seen a Republican put a Democrat in? 
This is not called equal time, Bill Maher. Hell to the <laughs> GD, no. That's crazy. All right, listen, I, 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 I got to go to break, but real quick, um, we got to end this segment on a funny note. Courtesy of Tim Scott. No. Press play. You believe the black community will come out for Trump this November? I, I have never seen the type of enthusiasm for a Republican presidential candidate that I'm seeing right now for President Donald Trump. Forty percent of African-American men are willing to vote for President Trump. Why? Because they had more money in their pockets. We had more law and order in the streets, and we had a greater future for our kids. Listen, President Trump is a president that says every child in every zip code deserves a quality education. President Trump is a president who says every neighborhood deserves more police, not defund the police, but let's refund, respect, and have our officers where they're needed the most. We as a people, the American people, love that. But African Americans are devastated by migrant crime. We're seeing African American kids staying home at school from school in New York City so they can put illegal immigrants in the schools. We're watching Colorado and Denver specifically zero out paychecks so illegal immigrants can have more money. That's devastating poor communities. President Trump stands with a backbone and says, not on my watch. <laughs> that boy need to be enrolled into the NFL's concussion protocol program. My it, goodness. At best. It, 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 Omar Congo, if he actually ain't no, not, you can't find a Twitter poll <laughs> that's showing 4% <laughs> of black men gonna vote for Donald Trump. He is the... No way. I don't know what the hell. I don't know what. I'm telling you right now. They need to issue mandate, pass the cup to him and Lindsey Graham because clearly both South Carolina senators are high as hell. They got something going on. There's something in the water. I, I don't know. And the fact that they can just get up and just boldly say these things and, and, and these commentators or, or these hosts or so-called hosts, they, they just buy it because it goes along with their propaganda. If... <sighs> Wow. And he just said it so confidently that with no citation whatsoever, and this is the type of stuff that he's going to continue to say, that Trump's going to continue to say as they hop, as they pump the sneakers, as they put out the fake images. And this is why, going back to the top of the sex story show tonight, this is why the investment in, in black media is so important, because you need to have real people who represent black media countering these narratives with actual facts, with actual posters, with actual surveys, with actual studies, and with actual scholars and activists who do this work. And Tim Scott demonstrates none of that, and no one on any of these shows is ever going to ask him about it either, and it's a shame. Two words for him, uh, Julian. Boy, bye. <laughs> <laughs> that is the biggest fool I've ever seen, but we know that. I mean, he's about as, as right as he is straight. In other words, uh, you know, he's just lying. He doesn't mind lying. Good for the network that had the facts behind him, which said that 27%, not 40%, of black folks were inclined. And understand this, Trump inclined does not mean Trump voter. We still mm -hmm. have six months in this election. We don't know what the, you know what is going to happen in these next six months. Here's what we do know. Uh, Tim Scott is bojangling for a possibility to be vice president. He is dancing like Mr. Bojangles, but it ain't gonna work. Um, well, it might work. But basically, he is a buffoon. He's always been a buffoon, but his buffoonery right now is on high steroids. That that was just silly, uh, Teresa. It was. Um, but I also think we should pay attention to the fine print of that poll. It was a Fox News poll. And, you know, we're not sure where the substance of that was coming from. Uh, but I, outside of, you know, who they were getting their polling location from. But it could have been their base. And their base with, you know, black Americans in it probably is, a, in its totality, 30 percent. So I, I don't see that that is a, a First wrong of all, number. If it's 30 percent of their base, hell, they got a real big problem. They, well, exactly. That means 70 percent of their own base voting for Biden. 
Exactly. And that's why, you know, when they have these little tactics of the Trump sneakers selling out for $12,000 and such, um, again, this is a ploy so the Biden and the Democratic Party can focus on the black community, um, which we we do need to focus on, but black men, I don't believe, is the focus. I think the focus is all the other issues that we talked about today. But, you know, with Tim Scott, you know, all I think about when I see him is his ad commercial of, you know, from Cotton Field to Congress and him standing in the middle of the field like he, you know, raped the, the grass. So it's just <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Every time I see Tim, Tim Scott talk, all I see him going, I love you. Mm. When he told Trump, I just love you. <laughs> Oh, Lord, let me go to a break. We come back, we're going to talk Alzheimer's, its impact on African Americans. Uh, and also, we'll talk to the mother of Mike, Mike Brown. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, killed by a cop uh, in suburban St. Louis. Uh, the work that his mother and father are doing to keep his memory alive. Folks, support us in what we do. Join our Bring the Funk fan club. The goal is to get 20,000 of our uh, subscribers, fans, uh, to contribute on average 50 bucks each. That's $4.19 a month, 13 cents a day. Send your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 200-37-0196. Cash App, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered, PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zell, Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. I'll be back in 60 seconds. It's Sammy Roman. Hey, it's John Murray, the executive producer of the new Sherry Shepard Talk Show. Hey, it's me, Sherry Shepard, and you know what you're watching, Roland Martin Unfiltered. Thousand folks are diagnosed annually with ALS. Uh, Nine percent of the folks' diagnoses uh, take place without a family history. Unfortunately, many African Americans, according to studies, show that African Americans get ALS they experience longer uh, delays in being diagnosed than white patients. Shauna Prince is director of communications at uh, AMALS, joining us from D.C. Shauna, why the disparities? Thank you for having me, Roland, and the organization is I am. Sorry, ALS. I am. I am ALS. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Thank you. So there are several reasons for the disparities between the, um, with the diagnosis. A lot of people think that ALS is what commonly some folks would just simply say is a white man's disease, but it's not. So let's back up a little bit and talk about exactly what ALS is. ALS is a nervous system disease that affects the nerve cells in the brain, the spinal cord, which causes loss of control of the muscles needed to move, speak, eat, and even breathe. ALS is commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease because it was named after the late baseball player, Lou Gehrig, who played for the um, New York Yankees. So we don't know the exact cause of ALS, but we do know that only 10 cases are generic genetic, excuse me, or hereditary. So with, when it comes to the Black community and trying to understand the disparities between the two, a lot of people need to understand that it's really the research. A lot of us need to participate in the clinical trials. And when I say a lot of us, I mean the Black community, the African-American communities, we need to be part in the data collection so that we are included in these numbers. A lot of the numbers are um, just not accurate because we're not taking part in so, 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 how, so, so how do we become a part uh, of these studies? How do we do that? So whenever you hear about a clinical trial, you can also check our website, 
to find out about clinical trials. The other thing is when a lot of us go to the doctors to find out what's going on, if we have a weakness in our hands or anything like that, a lot of African-Americans I diagnose later than the typical white person when it comes to this disease. Not saying that it's completely based on race. It's simply saying that diagnosis with ALS does take a while to simply identify. And um, and so so what is so I get hearing about it, uh, but when these but when these trials come up. Uh, what is the outreach to African Americans? Um, you know, what is the advertising outreach? What is the organizational outreach uh, to be included? Uh, because again, uh, for a lot of people not realize it, yes, it's named after Lou Gehrig who played baseball. Go to my iPad. I mean, this is a list of uh, NFL players that have actually uh, uh, been diagnosed and who've had uh, ALS. And so, I mean, these are folks who are, again, who are athletes, top of their game, uh, and uh, they've been impacted. Uh, and so, for folks who don't understand, I mean, we still don't know really uh, what drives this. And so, what's that outreach effort? So when it comes to the outreach, it's organizations like I am, ALS. We are an organization that is looking to do the work. We are doing the outreach. That's why I'm here on the show today. A lot of African-Americans, we think this is a disease that does not in impact us or affect us in any way, but we are part of those numbers. We need to make sure we are aware of organizations such as I am ALS. I just met a young man the other day when I was out for a walk doing the CIAA in Baltimore and just casually talking, come to find out one of his best boys, his mom is battling ALS. A lot of us in our community, when it comes to disease, we suffer in silence for some unknown reason. We do not have to suffer in silence. This is an opportunity for us to find our communities, find those organizations that actually care and use these resources to our best abilities. IMALS has support groups for those that are living with ALS, as well as those that are impacted. That means family members, friends. A lot of family members turn into caretakers. That's a, hell, a heck of a toll to take on as a loved one of someone battling ALS. It's a deadly disease. So you're watching your loved one literally digress in their health right before your eyes. That's tough. You need someone to talk to. We have peer support groups. We have um, many shades of ALS, which is for minorities specifically to sit and be able to talk about the various struggles that they have. It's a very expensive disease. The, a wheelchair could cost $5,000. For you to be diagnosed with a disease and then suddenly you need a $5,000 wheelchair, that's money that's going to come from where? So organizations like IMALS, once again, we help you with that journey. We meet you where you are, and we walk that journey with you to find where those places are, where those clinical trials are being held. They may be in your area, they may not, but at least we are giving you the information to find out your best bet to try to live a better life because, unfortunately, the lifespan of those diagnosed with ALS are typically between two and five years. Um, our questions, uh, real quick, run for my panel. Uh, Julian, you first. Sure. Uh, th first of all, thank you for the work. It's so very important. Uh, I have a cousin, uh, Myrna Malvo, who is uh, the mom of Suzanne Malvo, who many of us know, who actually made her transition after having ALS and very familiar with the many, many, many adjustments that had to be made, um, the equipment, its cost, the care that was taken. One of the issues, there are two things that I want to raise up. One, why aren't we in more clinical trials? Um, we don't get the information, that's one thing, but when we do get the information, we don't necessarily take choose to join clinical trials. So the reluctance of black people and clinical trials concerns me. Um, the second question I have around ALS is why there has not been more. We've seen people, and Suze, Suzanne and her family did a, a great piece on CNN, 
But we don't hear a lot about black people with ALS and what it means and what it costs and how devastating it is. Who takes up that public information campaign? So that, again, is why I am here tonight. I am looking to really raise the alarm, if you will, within the Black community. We don't know about it. We, we hear about diabetes every day. We hear about high blood pressure. Those are things that sadly <clears throat> affect the Black community at a higher rate. When we hear and think about any other disease, it's kind of like, that won't be me, right? We all think we're immune to certain things, but we're not. And until this hits your doorstep, that's when people pay attention, sadly. But again, organizations like I Am ALS, we are looking to get our voices out there. We're looking to make the impact and let people know that we exist. So even if you find out about I Am ALS, after your diagnosis, it's not too late. They're still welcome. We're still going to assist them. We're going to make sure that they are receiving all of the resources that they can. The reason I'm here, again, is to raise the awareness for people to at least have it in the back of their minds to know I am ALS exists. They are here to assist me. We don't care about your race. We don't care about your gender. We do not care about your uh, religion. We want to make sure that people are aware that we exist so that then when those clinical trials come along, we can reach out to our community and simply say, hey, this is an opportunity to share your voice and then get the assistance you need. We're a volunteer-based organization, so we have people on Capitol Hill, we have a legislative team, we have outreach. We are very, very strong, small but mighty organization. So anyone that wants to volunteer with us, Go to IamALS.org. You can volunteer with us in any way. You could be an advocate, get your representatives to understand the importance of this disease and to join us in battling this disease. I'm a Congo. Everyone's voice. I'm a Congo. Thank you so, so much, Ms. Prince, for the great work that you're doing. Do you feel like there is a medical diagnosis gap in terms of the doctors, in terms of them not feeling, you know, Black people can suffer from this so they don't really look for it? Or is it more of an issue of Black people who have it are coming in too late after already having it and not being diagnosed in the first place? Well, I will not um, blame the doctors on misdiagnosis or late diagnosis solely. I will simply say that it is a challenge when it comes to being diagnosed with ALS. Doctors have to go through various screenings and sometimes the data, every state also, the a bigger issue here, every state does not have to report their numbers when it comes to mm. ALS. So some people are diagnosed and that may just stay in whatever state that may be. Others do the responsible um, task and report those numbers. So there are a lot of things that can work against us when we're trying to get accurate numbers and representation through the entire country. So it, it's a lot of challenges. But another thing I need people to understand is that when it comes to ALS and our community, there are veterans for some unknown reason, the research is not um, complete just yet, but veterans are affected by ALS at even a larger rate than the average person. So that's another thing. A lot of African Americans, as we know, are in the US military. So this is another reason for us to take that initiative and make sure that we are paying attention to our health and checking in with our doctors. Teresa. Shauna, thank you so much for your passion and purpose. Even um, someone in communications, myself, literally, you were going down each of my questions. I think my last question is, um, as we uh, end this segment, what questions can Black Americans ask their doctors regarding ALS symptoms? That's an excellent question. Um, I think before you even have to worry about putting the full trust in your doctor, pay attention to your bodies as well. 
when we have a weakness in our arms, we have a weakness in the grip of our hands, those little things, let's not just blow those things off. Let's make sure that we are listening to our bodies and we are taking note. We all have an iPhone or a smartphone of some sort or a notepad with grandma and grandpa. A notepad is nearby. Take note of what your body is telling you. And when you have your yearly physical, your routine checkup, make sure that you are relaying these things to your doctor. Something as minor as not being able to grip the remote control or your phone as strongly as you used to, that could be a sign. I'm not diagnosing everybody with a loose grip with ALS. I'm simply saying pay attention to your bodies and make sure that you're relaying this information to your doctors. The final thing that I will share with your audience, Roland, is that, again, so many of us have family members, friends, or associates who are battling ALS in silence. I need everyone to know you can honor that loved one by simply going to our website, imals.org. We have a community summit coming up this May. At the end of May, May 29th through June 1st, we have a summit coming up. You can sign and dedicate a flag to your loved one who is battling ALS, who is impacted by ALS, who has passed away from ALS. We have a goal of having 6,000 flags on the National Mall, and this will be a community summit once again. So a visual memorial to anyone impacted by ALS. So we hope that you will join us. Again, my condolences to anyone who has lost a loved one to this deadly disease, but we are stronger together. So please join us in this fight. All right. Shana Prince, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Have a good one. All right, folks, coming back, uh, we'll talk with the mother of Mike Brown about what they continue to do to honor uh, his uh, life. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. On the next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, just who do you think you are? And maybe more importantly, who is it that you think you're trying to please? The answer to that second question is really wrapped up in the first. Think about that. Being the true, authentic you, no matter the circumstance. But we learn the art of forgiveness, not only of forgiving one another, but forgiving ourselves. And we also learn how to love ourselves so that we can love each other. That's next on A Balanced Life, here on Black Star Network. Hey, what's up, y'all? I'm Devon Frank. I'm Dr. Robin B., pharmacist and fitness coach, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Well, Teresa Omicongo, Julian, it's going to be a lot of upset. White people in Virginia, they've now become the second state to ban legacy in admissions. Joining Colorado, that ban took place in 2021. Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin signed the bill, House Bill 48, on Friday. It will, it will prevent family connections from giving applicants to prestigious institutions such as the University of Virginia and William and Mary uh, in upper hand. Boy, you know, they always crying about uh, DEI and affirmative action. Uh-huh. Let's, let's get rid of them legacy admissions, Teresa. 
Well, it's a disgrace because, you know, when we talk about generational wealth, when we talk about, you know, legacy and missions, it means, you know, it's honestly, it's the same thing that Harvard, Yale, Stanford, that they have, right? Somebody's grandparent, somebody's father, somebody's mother went there, and thus, you know, their kid goes there. Legacy is all of a sudden a bad word, and I, I think it, it just does damage onto the next admission student. So, frankly, you know, if, if, if it's banned, then maybe I should just go one time and, and never recommend this school. And I think institutions and universities should take a look at that a little bit closer. It's also a throwback to Jim Crow on Congo because if your grandparents went to Virginia schools and you use legacy, guess what? They weren't admitting black people. So that means that white student has an upper hand over the African-American. Yeah, and let's also be honest, and going back to some of these old, older cases, a lot of legacy admissions develop to help uh, keep, you know, Jewish uh, students from attending college, going, you know, going back further than that. And so we have to be mindful of the fact that one of the challenges we're going to see is that people who are still influential, still have money, still have clout, they're still going to find ways to, to get their kids in there. It's kind of similar to these, you know, reproductive conversations. You know, people who are, are don't have as many me as much means are going to have a harder time getting things like abortions and the like. People who are wealthier are not going to have that problem. So I'm concerned that he's, you know, putting out something that they feel is going to be kind of equitable for everybody, but it's still not going to play out as it relates to anybody who's a legacy child not getting in. I still think it's going to affect us who are graduates of these schools uh, more than people who may who are white and maybe have uh, better means to get them, their kids in there anyway. Well, here's the other deal. I don't hear Joe Rogan and Christopher Rufo complaining mm -hmm. about uh, these unqualified white kids who get in based upon legacy. Oh, like Jerry Kushner, whose daddy dedicated, uh, gave $2 million uh, to his college. That's how he got in. There you go. Julian? You know, uh, Roland, what's fascinating here, their so-called banning legacy, but it's a smokescreen for them to attack affirmative action. Because one of the biggest pushbacks that we've had around affirmative action admissions is we would then say, yes, but what about the legacy admissions. People get in just because they daddy, they mama, they somebody gave some money. And so they said, we'll get rid of that. But then that gives them a cover to get rid of DEI admissions as well. So we, would, we shouldn't be seduced into thinking, oh, gee, this is a great thing. Oh, gee, it means that they are more aware. What it means is that they're prepared to fight our inclusion in the space by whatever means necessary, even if it affects some of them in a deleterious way. Because Oba Congo has said, even when it affects them negatively, they can figure out a workaround. And they can always figure out a workaround. And we don't have the means or the space or the dollars Got it. to figure out workaround. Folks, uh, August 9th will be 10 years since the uprising in Ferguson began, of course, with the uh, shooting death of Mike Brown. Well, the folks at Campaign Zero have created uh, a scholarship uh, in his uh, name. Joining us right now is Leslie McFadden, is the uh, mother of Mike Brown. Uh, Leslie, tell us about uh, this scholarship. How you doing, Roland? Doing Thanks great. for having me on tonight. Mm -hmm. The scholarship we've put together with Campaign Zero and the Michael O.D. Brown We Love Our Sons and Daughters Foundation, it's um, a $3,000 scholarship for the arts, trades, and any social justice program you are entering in after um, high school. This is for inbound seniors. We have chose some local high schools, Normandy, University City, Riverview Gardens, McClure, and the Central Provision Arts. And um, we have had a lot of applicants, and we're excited to read them and pick the winners. So it'll be uh, one $3,000 scholarship? There's five for Normandy, and there's two for the other six remaining high schools. Gotcha. Two, and, three thousand, and, yes. And uh, that's for them. Now, you say it, incoming seniors. So is this... So It's I, inbound seniors leaving for high school. So a lot of these seniors are already showing us their submit admission letters and their acceptance letters, and we're excited for them as well. Gotcha. Uh, and so uh, this obviously... Now, does this apply to... Community colleges, trade schools. I mean, so what does it scholarship money apply uh, apply to? It applies to all the above: trade schools, um, community colleges, HBCUs, and any other college that they've been accepted to. It's for them and where they choose to go, 
it's their choice, but we, we want to know that they are going somewhere to support them in their journey. Uh, why this, th these particular focus? Because uh, you said, you said arts, what else did you say? I said social justice, performing arts, and trades. Got and it. that's because we need more inclusion in all of those areas, especially from our black and brown children. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, yes. and, and so, and so y'all, and so it's, it, it, but it's concentrated on a certain number of schools there in the St. Louis area. Yes, it is. Gotcha. Uh, if people want more information or if they want to contribute to the scholarship fund, uh, where do they go? They can go to michaelodbrown.org slash apply, and you can check us out at campaignzero.org and also on Fox 2 St. Louis. All right, then. Uh, well, mm -hmm. Leslie, we appreciate you joining us, uh, getting the word about the scholarship. And so uh, certainly uh, I'm sure those students will greatly appreciate uh, receiving uh, those funds. Always, always imp uh, good to get some money from somewhere. <laughs> yes, it is. Thank you. <laughs> All right. You be well. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. All right, let me thank Teresa Omakongo and Julian for being on today's show. Thank you so very much. Appreciate uh, y'all being here. Fantastic conversation. Uh, look forward to doing it again. Thank all of you for watching and listening as well. Y'all know uh, what we do here is critically important, folks. What we do here, frankly, other folks don't do. There's no other black-owned media outlet that does, uh, four, that does five hours of live news every single day uh, that we do here on the Black Star Network. Uh, our goal is to add more shows, uh, and so we want to be able to cover the stories that matter to you. Uh, and so please join our Bring the Funk fan club. Send your check-in money order. P.O. Box 57196. Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zell, rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. Be sure to download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Watch our 24 hour, seven day a week streaming channel available on Amazon News by going to Amazon Fire. You can tell Alexa to play news from the Black Star Network. You can also go to Plex TV, Amazon Freebie, Amazon Prime Video. Be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Available, bookstores nationwide. Get the audio version on Audible. Tomorrow, we'll talk about Marsha uh, Fudge stepping down as the HUD secretary, uh, the second, second cabinet member in Biden's cabinet to step down. Also, major, major issues happening in Haiti. We'll be talking to Jacqueline Charles, the award-winning reporter for the Miami Hero, about what's happening there as well. Lots of stuff to break down tomorrow. Y'all want to join us. Look forward to being here. And shout out to Winston-Salem State. I'm rocking their hoodie today. Uh, and so I'll see y'all tomorrow. Holla! Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black own media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?